Okay, so there yeah, are not so many left. Uh, I hope not to bore you. <laughs> um, so I'm a Sikhus Karakansis. I'm going to talk a bit, a bit briefly about me because I've seen that all the other speakers they had a bio. I have promised to send you one and I didn't. So <laughs> let me just introduce myself. So I'm a Sikhus Karakansis. I'm a computer scientist at uh, the Swiss National um, uh, Supercomputing Center. Uh, my background is uh, computer science. I have a PhD in computer science, uh, where I focus mostly on performance engineering of uh, some sparse linear uh, algebra. Uh, the last years, I have been the lead developer of Reframe, to whom I'm going to present you, uh, which is a regression testing framework for writing uh, tests for HPC systems. And So basically my talk will have two parts. The first part I'm going to present the tool and the use case. Uh, the second part, if we have time, I'm going to show you also its uses as a CI tool um, for uh, software, for scientific software. So you can use both. So a little, a little bit about background. Uh, we have at our center uh, a regression suite written in bus which was actually was used um, to test, uh, when the system was getting back, uh, to test that the applications were performing, the scientific application were performing the expected, some behaviors of the system, behavior of the system from the user's perspective uh, were consistent and so on and so forth. The key problem with that was that it is the, the logic of interactions with the system were very tightly coupled with uh, with the test itself. And we had really lots of code replications in there, and the whole uh, code base of the test was amounting uh, in, I mean, to 15 k lines of cell script code. Even simple changes, like, um, for example, at some point we moved from Slurp plus AP RAM, those that they have uh, run Cray, uh, AP RAM is the Cray workload manager that used to go from uh, the internal login nodes to uh, compute nodes. Uh, we, we migrated to Slurm plus, uh, plus SLA, that's native Slurm, and it was really uh, a big team effort uh, for our team, the scientific computing support team, to move all these tests to the new um, the, um, architecture. And the problem was that the logic was uh, coupled, so even if even simple bugs, you had to do the fix in all the tests and so on and so forth. So this couldn't scale at all. Nobody wanted to write new tests, uh, and uh, when a great was not happening, then all the team was really doomed. So then we came up with the idea of writing a regression testing framework from scratch. And actually, there wasn't something quite similar outside there. Uh, so, the good thing before starting is that we knew exactly what the problems are. We knew the problems, we knew what we would like to do. So, we came up with a reframe. Back then, it was not, it was not called reframe. We were called like pi regression or something in internal lane. We didn't have the imagination. And the whole idea is to write portable HPC regression tests in a high level language and do not and you should not care about the details of the system, whether it's learned, whether it's running on your local laptop, whether you're running your PBS machine, uh, or whether you have uh, different module systems and stuff. You should not care. You should just focus on the logic of this test. Because we want to make it easy for other people to contribute tests and people uh, in the team and also people in the operations. So this is a bit how it evolved. So the project started internally on March 2016 uh, when I started from a blank file uh, working on this project and uh, by the uh, as a pilot project, and then by August I had the first prototype, 
Uh, and then on December 2016, we have a big upgrade of the system. The system went down, uh, down for um, two months because we updated the GPUs. And at this point, we already had some tests, and we put also the, uh, the system in production. Uh, we first released publicly the framework in, uh, in 2017 after the uh, CAC conference, the Create User Group. Uh, where we also introduced a synchronous execution of tests, and then by last February we we, we published also our, our checks so that people can keep up and just take our tests, other centers, and adapt them to their um, to their infrastructure. Today we're growing. I'm going to show who else is using it later on. And um, we already have 18 forks, and 39 people are interested at least in looking and following the progress. Um, so we hope to, to get more attention. So right from the beginning, as I said before, we had some specific design goals. We tried, we tried and we still try to, um, uh, to, to be focused on that. So first thing is productivity. We want the team to be able to write easy tests. Second is portability. When we want to move the test, because we can have a simple test like a hello world that checks that the environment is working, uh, you don't want to do adaptations when you move to another system. We just want to be the same test because I don't care uh, how I, I will run on a different system. Uh, next thing, speed and video of, of use. This is important because uh, the operations, the operations team didn't want to uh, have to pass uh, thousands of options to the tool uh, or try to debug it. So it is important that it's easy to use and be to it, the, the command line interface. And also robustness for the same reason. And regarding the robustness, we were actually really focused right from the beginning. So every line, not every line, but every, everything in the code is really unit tested. Unit was designed in a test-driven um, approach. So actually, if you get into the code, you will see there is 91% coverage, and you can go up to 94% of the whole code, and also, um, uh, it's, I mean, apart from the, apart from the coverage, we're also, um, yeah, I, I, I know anyway, I mean, it's, it's very well tested, the code. So, unit test from the, from the beginning. And whenever we find a new bug, we write a test case so that we make sure there's no regressions in the framework itself. So here I'm just listing a couple of uh, important features. Uh, first of all, we separate the programming environment configuration and the system configuration from the test logic. So this will go to the different configuration file. We support cycling through programming environments. Uh, in Gray system, that's usually we have the default. They simply default with four programming environments: Gray, Gray compiled for the new compiled for the Intel and the PCI ones. Uh, you can define on your system your own programming environments as the compilers you want to test for each system for its partition. Um, the regression tests are written in Python. Uh, they require minimal knowledge of Python. It's really declarative the way you're writing. Uh, but if you know Python, you can even uh, do very advanced things. And that's the, so it gives you the flexibility. So even if you're not um, so much into Python, you just learn that you can just write easily, very easily tests. I will show you a simple example. But if you're also much deeper into, Py uh, into Python, then again, you can do really uh, very nice things on organizing your tests and all these things. We support sanity and performance tests. That was a requirement from the beginning. Uh, we, there are some tests that we just need to test the sanity of the system, but we also, it's important enough for us to test the application performance, and we don't have performance regression. This is quite important for, um, for ensuring the quality of service to our users. Uh, we, it generates progress and reality reports. Uh, another thing is, we do performance logging, uh, that we can send the results directly to a great, great log server. Um, 
And another important thing for those that they would like to contribute by, uh, all the internal, we also make a significant effort to keep the internal APIs quite clean. So that also uh, increases the immutability of the code, but also uh, you can easily, uh, the functionality of the framework can be easily expanded. We support uh, the two workload managers, Learn and Torque. Uh, several parallel job launchers, SN, MPA, RM, and Exec, and, and others. Uh, multiple environment modules for okay. That means that if your, your system might use Tmod, might use Tmod 4, might use Lmod 4, Lmod, you just write in your test, I want that module, and you don't care how this is going to be loaded. This is part of the configuration. Um, you can also build your, your code with different buckets. This has nothing to do with easy build. Uh, this is just for uh, if you have a test or a code that users for uh, for development, just a way of abstraction, just for the basic dev tools that uh, most of the people are using. Uh, another important feature is a synchronous execution of regression tests. Uh, the framework is able to submit uh, several uh, regression tests at the same time in the cluster, and don't have to monitor them themselves. The tool monitors them themselves, makes sure when it finishes to proceed with the uh, subsequent phases. Uh, and uh, this really speeds up the things. So because it keeps the schedule busy. Uh, busy. Um, and the other important thing is we have complete documentation. You can start off with tutorial and then go up to the reference guides. We really invested in, in that aspect. So here is a picture of the architecture, a high level one. So there are two people here, two users. This is the guy that's writing the regression test and he interfaces with the regression test API. We're going to show you what it is. Basically, uh, the API that he uses to write the test. Now, internally, there are some system and environment instructions and um, and the API only talks to those. That doesn't know even the API doesn't know what exactly going back in the system. So here there are the, the the backends which you can replace or you can create your own that talk to the I mean they implement the abstractions and they talk directly to operating system uh, uh, functionality. For example. Uh, here there's a different backend for Slurm, a different backend for PBS, a different backend for Slurm if you don't have the accounting command and the doc that actually is, uh, that actually uh, call the s files and all these functions. The same for the launcher, same for the builders, for the build systems and environment launchers. On the left, it's what we call the front end. Uh, this is, apart from the command line interface, uh, it's what it drives the execution of the test. It's, it's, it takes the test of the user and it uh, passes them through uh, a, a pipeline in different spaces, uh, which I'm going to show you in a moment. So how, how it seems like right, the regression test in the frame. Here is full performance test that, um, uh, that actually implement, it, that runs the matrix factor multiplication the CUDA version of it, and it tests it with different programming environments, and uh, it is also checks the performance. Let me walk a bit through it. So, the frame tests are simple Python classes that they have to extend this framework pro provided regression test uh, class and be specially decorated. Uh, and then, this is like the boilerplate that you have to write plus call the, uh, the constructor of the, of the base test. Now, a, a simple description. Here is what the system that, the configured basically system that this test may not know. So for this, it's only meaningful for the main CPU partition, for the hybrid loads of our system. Uh, and here are the programming environments that is, uh, uh, that, that can run with. Uh, here is the, a source file. It can also be a directory. It can also be uh, a complete uh, software package. This is how it's going to build it. 
uh, you may have here we call it a single source. So you just let me fix this display because it's okay. Okay, that's good. Um, how to compile it? Here is what options to pass to the executor is going to be generated. Here are some other stuff like new GPUs. Uh, this is specific for this test. Another important thing is the modules to get loaded. And here is what to check. So here is this, what we call sanity patterns. Is uh, it is an expression uh, that uh, will check the sanity of the output. Here we just say that assert that this thing is found in SDPR. This is a single grep like thing. But this actually there's lots of functions here that we call sanity function that you can do, you can extract data, you can compute address, you can run your own functions, you can do any post-processing you like to, 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 um, so as to assess the sanity of your, um, of your test. Similarly, the similar mechanism behind the scene is what we call perf patterns, where it actually is the dictionary that you define uh, performance values, you name them uh, as you wish, uh, and then you use again an expression of, for extracting this value. For example, in this case, uh, we're saying, okay, uh, extract from this regular expression when it matches and standard output, extract this uh, capturing group that we named Gigaflows and convert it to float and assign it to this performance variable. And then you have a reference for each of your performance variable that it can write persistent. So here for uh, the GPU system, this performance is 50 giga plus, uh, plus minus 10%. If you have more systems here and your test was about to be tried in other systems, you just have to uh, add additional metrics in this one. And then there are some uh, additional stuff like maintainers. If, if the test is failed, it will just bring uh, who you should contact to. Um, and uh, the tax, the tax is, is quite um, an uh, a useful, at least for us, mechanism. You just tag your tasks so that then you take your, your test so that then you can uh, easily um, uh, select them and filter them, not just by their name. We're going to see with how uh, you can filter tests. So let's see how, how this runs. So every test goes through a pipeline, a regression test pipeline, which is a set of well defined phases. This is like the backbone of the framework. It, it has been the same from the day one up to now. So first thing, I mean, the framework picks the next test, checks if it supports the current system or the current uh, or, or the programming environment to test. If yes, uh, there it, it passes it passes it through these phases. First is the setup phase where the test is set up. Uh, for the specific partition or for the specific environment that we run, because sometimes you might need to do the test might need to do some specialization based on the programming environment it runs, then it it is compiled, then it is run. This way it is executed asynchronously. Uh, as soon as it finishes, uh, the sanity check takes place, then the performance check, and then the cleanup uh, of the resources. We're going to see what the resources are in a, in a minute. What is important is um, that, uh, yeah, before, before yeah. here is, um, so, as I said, so this is the pipeline, but some tests may decide to skip some phases. This is possible. We have compiler only tests that they just need to compile something, and there are only tests that they don't execute the compiles, they, they go, they skip this phase, and they just go directly to the run phase. Uh, you can, for all these phases, there are corresponding methods that you can just override uh, and uh, and basically uh, customize the behavior of the test uh, for this phase. The most common, 99% of the cases, uh, the only uh, the only customization will happen during the setup phase. I don't think we have any test. That Overrides any other uh, any other part of the pipeline except for a couple of exceptions. They're special. Now the front end uh, passes through the front end. I call the 
the, the command line interface and the thing that drives later the pipeline. So there are three, again, we have three distinct phases. And we wanted to keep this the whole design discipline. So the first is the discovery of the tests. So you pass it, you, and, and there are options controlling all the three, these three phases. Discovery of the test is the framework goes in searches in um, your directories or where you point it to for tests that they are, for Python files, that they are actually different tests. There is a mechanism there that you can uh, understand it. Then there is a test selection where those loaded tests are filtered out. So you can filter the test by name, by programming environment, by tag. So you can say, I, I want all the tests that uh, they, are, they support the, the GNU programming environment and they are production. I have five months production. Then you just got this test. The third phase is the action. Action can be either list the test, so you can see what's going to be done, or run the test. Another important thing with the refrain that we have really um, invested into that is how it handles the environment. So we wanted to emulate what the users are doing. So we didn't want to have um, to run something in an environment that is not, does not correspond to the users. And for that reason, we, we, we were very careful in uh, replicating this behavior. So first of all, we did not rely on module pairs. Module per pairs. The key reason for that is, first of all, this is a really a direct road to disaster for Cray systems. If anybody is around Cray system that module pairs, then he cannot even load back uh, uh, the, the, the default environment. Um, and then this is not what users are doing in any case. So we didn't want to, to rely on that. So what the frame does is when it enters, it actually stores uh, the environment and takes the functions of it, then modifies it for the test, runs the test, then restores this when the test case fails. And that does that, uh, like, make easy to do somehow. Um, another thing is that when you ask to load conflicting modules, the framework takes automatically care of it. So, for example, uh, you, you, your default programming environment is, is GCC, and you need, or you have a module loaded already in your system, and in your test, you just ask it to load another one, then this will happen automatically. The, the framework will see that conflict and regenerate the correct instructions to run your test and set up this environment. Here is how you can run it. This is uh, the standard command line. So there is also a default config. Here is the path to your config. Um, here is the path to the checks. Uh, that you want to load, and the minus R is to run the framework. When it runs, the frame keeps three directories. Uh, the first is the stage directory, where everything happens, where the test runs. So the, the resources of the test are copied over there. Uh, what are the resources? It's the sources, the source files, any input files that you have specified. Uh, all of them is copied there. Then the framework changes to that directory temporarily, executes, and uh, gets back. So this is like a sandbox. You have everything there. And you have also, um, we will see just later on, that there you can find also the actual script that you can also reproduce the behavior of the, of, of, of the framework. Then there is the output directory. I would perhaps call it better than it would be an archive directory, where actually, uh, by default, the, the job name, the, the jobs and build scripts, and the in out and out and other error are uh, saved uh, for later inspection. Uh, but also in your test, you can specify additional files to be archived. Uh, and then there is the performance log directory, which is a directory uh, based on the name of the test, where um, every time a performance test is run, then this file for this specific test. Uh, is uh, <coughs> updated with the new performance point. So then you can uh, plot it, you can do the report and post process the logs. Mm -hmm. And of course, there is a summary uh, report at the end, uh, and especially for your report. Uh, 
So here is how it looks like. Uh, we use a bit of a Google test um, look at feed. This is the serial execution. So you see here is a single test that is uh, tried for different programming environments. Uh, you see how it goes. And then you have, I run three test, three test cases from one tag. So that's, you have a single test and then you, you really uh, uh, can expand a lot. Here's an example of a failure. Um, here is the, the report you're getting at the end. Uh, the, the important thing is that the out, this output is not mounted in the uh, output of what is going on. So you just get a fail, and then at the end you will get it all he, uh, uh, everything summed here. And uh, you can see where, where the test was running, which was the programming environment it was trying, where you can find the files, the states directory. So you can get into there. Uh, you will find the scripts, uh, and you can try yourself. You can just try to play a bit and see what was the wrong, uh, what was going wrong. Uh, you can find budget by the so you can uh, check the database if something was there. Uh, here you get what was the failing phase in that pipeline that I showed you before. Here it was the performance, and there you get. Uh, this is the performance number I got, and it's beyond my reference value, which was supposed to be seventy. Uh, and here you get the lower and upper bounds. So how you examine a failure? Uh, you get into the state directory, and there you could find this set of files. Uh, so these are the build. If it was a compiled and build test as well, um, then you will find the actual build script generated and the output and error. And that's so then you can easily inspect what is going on. And because in the output you will see that. Uh, the test has failed in the compiled phase, so you know what, what has gone wrong. Uh, here uh, you have the, um, uh, the, the job, the actually uh, job script generated and the output of the error. If, if the frame can, can run also on, on systems like your laptop where you don't have SERM or any workload monitor, it will just generate a single bus script for that. Um, performance logs. This is, uh, as I said before, uh, for each performance test, the training produces um, uh, a test load that is always appended. Here, for example, you get, this is the default output. It's fully configurable from the configuration. You can have the format you like, the information you want to print out from the test. Everything is configurable. And but if, if you set up a Greylog server, and, and, and tell that to refrain that uh, please send your logs to that payload server, and then it will just send the logs which then you can load. This is actually from a real application, it's the GPU version of the application, and, and here's the CPU version over, over time. So, I, I, this, is, this is very fresh. I, I, we were at Easy Build uh, user meeting, and uh, a guy there just said, well, it's easy to prove to configure. Uh, it's, while, while Victor was giving the talk, he was able to configure the run in his laptop where he has learned. So I took this quote from him because I think it's very interesting. So now I'm going to see you. Okay, so let me just. I'm going to see a bit more complex configuration. You can find it online in the tutorial. Uh, this is a real configuration for our system, Big State. Uh, so here is it. Your site, it, it, everything comes into a dictionary. Uh, so you just give it a name, then what is this? Host names is uh, a list of regular ex expressions where. This is just for auto detection of the system. So whenever you run the frame, in order to be able to auto detect through host name, uh, um, to be uh, through host name to be able to detect uh, this system, and I say, ah, okay, now I'm running on the end. So I will load this configuration. 
You can manually specify that you use it. What's the module systems that's used? That's team mode, you can use M mode um, or team mode 4. And then you define partitions. These are not necessarily scheduled partitions. This is just logical virtual partitions that uh, you just want to, uh, just for a frame. So here we define three, two partitions. We have the login, where corresponds to the login nodes. We say, we don't have a scheduler here, uh, that's local, that means that the tests that they are meant to run there will not be submitted. And here are the environments to test. For this we use actually just um, test of the safety environment. And, uh, and then we have this max jobs, it's just to control when you run in the synchronous mode, just to put a limit on how many jobs it, it will spawn. Here it, how many processes, essentially. Um, then you have the GPU here. Here we use native there, which means you will submit jobs through its bus and use SCAN as a parallel launcher. Uh, modules, that's an optional thing. And you say which modules from, uh, from the software are to load when you launch the, the, the job. So for us, is we have all the software stack is under this module. Then how you get access to the partition is a list of options to be passed. Here is constraint equal to CPU, you do have minus P partition and anything else. Again, the environments to check, description and the max job. Now, these are not module names. These again are symbolic names, and that's, and that's quite powerful. There's a second section in the configuration where you actually define what these are. So this is a type of programming environment, and what are the modules to load for that? You can define, you can keep you can keep a name, a single name, that you will use in all in, uh, you will use it in all your tests, and just for each of your system, you can just define this diff differently of what's going to be loaded. And I'm not going to go in more details with the configuration, but it's easy to follow and um, uh, to that. Actually, from all the people that they are using, I have never got uh, a question about uh, how I configure it. And I know people are using it. Uh, so, what's our uh, use case? Bye bye. Bye So, our use case is we have three production systems that are flagship. Uh, this is from used by MetaSuite for doing the actual um, uh, weather prediction. And this is another cluster for some private customers. Uh, we have in total 241 different tests that they are used across system. Uh, the majority of them are, are for the for the big system. And then we have two categories of tests. We have what we call production. So we take we test the system while it's in production nightly and make sure that nothing has been broken. And uh, where we have a wide uh, suite uh, with uh, its application libraries, programming environments. It's, it's not actually 90 minutes, it's, yeah, it's in the, in the best case it's like 40 minutes when the system is not so much loaded. And runs uh, overnight. And then we have the maintenance, which every, after maintenance we have a very limited of, a set of crucial applications that uh, our, our system means are just running the frame, and if they see problem, they ask us uh, what's the problem with this application or if something is wrong. And actually, we, and we have got several problems or things that uh, have gone wrong in maintenance and um, uh, we prevent them before the system going out. This is our, our daily production setup. So basically we have a Jenkins VM uh, where we connect through VPN and this spawns SSH slaves on the login node of the different machines. And actually this machine um, uh, and on this login nodes we run the frame, and this reframe that spawns, spawns the job. So here how it looks like, the web API of Jenkins, here for example we have the different, that's for, for the cache project, for the cache system. Um, here we have the results, here we, we can examine when something, everything is fine. When you have a failure, then you can go into this uh, interface, see the failures, see exactly, then scroll a bit down, see what's going on. Now, um, so, Reframe uh, is, as I said, I mean, 
a powerful tool that allows you to continually, continuously test your HPC cluster and it's easy to write a test with it. Uh, the advantages are that the tests are written in a high level language, so you don't have to um, bother with lots of details, it's easy to write, and then on the other hand, you get the flexibility to structure your test to avoid, to, to make them more, more maintainable. Uh, portability across the PC system and comprehensive reports as some of them. We're actively developing it and we also uh, regularly release, either dev releases every, every month or dev release and every two, two or three dev releases we have is, um, a full release. But generally, I wouldn't be afraid even to use master because really the frame was very well tested. So that nothing gets into master <coughs> unless all our CI has passed and we are also a bit tough with the code review process, so I think the quality is quite high. Future direction, um, we're, we're working on supporting dependencies across tests. Uh, also seamless support for containers. You can right now use a frame to, to run container tests, uh, but you have to, to, you have to be a bit more explicit in writing the test in, in, some, in some places. We want to have a similar support and native support for that and hide this complexity, make the test portable as well. And we want to introduce an explicit benchmarking mode where uh, actually we run performance tests and instead of just breaking, breaking pass or fail, we just also print that this test gave me uh, this performance, this test gave me that performance and so on and so forth. That would help benchmarking new systems in an easy way. Another thing that came out for the uh, last week is that we, we, we will be working on integration with EasyBuild so that uh, you will be able to run a different step in EasyBuild that would um, spawn the frame, test the just build uh, and installed, uh, just build uh, recipe. We have figured out the details and we just need to jump up into implementation and see whether we have missed anything or not. So who else is using it? Here I gather, I, I gather the people that they have talked to me. So uh, and anybody they're not the only ones. Because I was in supercomputing um, last November and uh, a lady from Ohio Supercomputing Centers uh, raised their hand and said, we have deployed the refraining in production. I hope she can never talk to me. And she asked um, how I could I can contribute back uh, our tests and the kind of things. This is another thing we're working on. We have some ideas. Um, so I know that uh, Nick has has put in production and uh, Nerst there. Uh, Nerst is considering to put in production. That was the last. Uh, so they're testing it. Uh, and then also is uh, has done also some feature requests. Um, ASML is a company that has deployed it. Uh, Bosi, I know that they wanted to run. Uh, then I've got a user from Rutgers, uh, which asked a configuration question though, but it was a pretty good answer. So he's trying it. And there are some guys that they have forked it and they have done some changes from Birmingham. I need to talk to them and say, hey guys, um, you, yeah, but what, what's your use case? And yeah, you can think about it. Um, here are the contributions. We're, we're, we're not working all full time on the frame, that's, that's for sure. It's, but because it's not our sole job, sole, sole, uh, job. So, but nonetheless, all those people have contributed to the framework and the whole uh, former scientific community support and ops teams have uh, contributed to this. I have some additional slides, I don't know, this is up to you completely, um, how, whether you would be interested to see how, I have three slides basically, um, on how a frame can be used in conjunction with, okay, so, yes, reframe, you can use it for software testing for HPC applications. I mean, why not go just the classic way, which is Travis, when this is not our Travis or Jenkins uh, with, uh, containers and stuff, which is a st very standard way in the DevOps ecosystem. The key thing here, the key complication is that to properly test, 
an HPC application, you need also to test the API, you need to test performance. This you cannot do it on the VM. So this is CSS provides a CI service, but uh, I'm going to show you quickly how you can use the same frame test to run from your laptop to supercomputing center to the CSS service like from CSS that we use Jenkins. Uh, you can you can use, uh, use the same test to run on Travis and so on. So CSS provides a CI service to its users. Uh, which is based on, on Jenkins. And uh, so the idea is that there is a, a Jenkins VM that is very restricted. It can only run as bus. And, uh, and then inside of this bus, then the users can write their own text, which is set script normally. So they will have to do um, or some intake test that runs the, the unit test, and then in the Jenkins file, which is the descriptor file for uh, managing the CI service of Jenkins, they could have to implement a whole lot of logic. I, I there was a user that has like, like a thousand lines Jenkins file that was really unusual. And then we talk about, look, you can use Google Frame, he's really interested in that. So the integration steps in that case is you add Jenkins files to your process that's necessary if you want to trigger. Uh, the Jenkins CI. You should have a bad script for running a reframe on the computer nodes and this can configure a uh, reframe. So you can, since the only, in our case, the only thing allowed is to do is bugs, you need to, to add a, a combined script that just do as bugs, that script and that script only it, it runs the frame. There, there, we are also thinking for a better integration, but this is just a proof of concept. Uh, you just have the configuration entry in your config for the target system, in this case the compute nodes of thing, and you simply have your frame test. And all the bad logic of messing with the system is, uh, is handled by, by the framework. The same for, for Travis actually. Uh, you, Travis runs on the VM on the cloud, you need to add your Travis.yaml file, other configuration entry for the Travis VM that you're going to run and that you're referring to tests. And we, we have done this. So here is um, the output of a CI. And I don't know if I have the, the test yet. I don't have the test in task that in, in this presentation. Um, this is a, a code that's called Arbor, a neuroscience code that have, is developed from a, from a team uh, of CSCS based in Zurich. Uh, I have implemented the a CI for them, and here is this. This is this is how it looks like from the from the Jenkins. Everything is fine, and here you see the output and standard frame test. So, and you can see that I'm running uh, the base configuration, the MPI configuration, the GPU configuration, uh, the CD configuration with uh, the Haskell backend. And everything. And actually, when I was playing with that, I came, I came up with bugs that they didn't support the very correctly in the compiler. So some basic tests, compilation tests, they were failing. And I taught them to, to fix them. Uh, now, in fact, there was another um, um, effort done by, by Victor, uh, where he had another code with another proof of concept. And here you see uh, the different things. It's Python, yeah, it's everywhere Python 3.6. I think you, you've done that because you, you, he needed Python in the VM, so he configured Travis to have Python because he needed the Python to run the frame. And inside the frame, uh, he installed the GTC version he wanted and then responded to the test. So that's all. And I'll be glad to answer any questions. Yeah. So you say you run this nightly on your cluster. Right? Yes. But you submit it as a job. Yes. With a high priority. No. Whereas just so it's the question. Ah, yeah. Yeah. So the question was uh, whether we submit where the where the, the nightly jobs we submit have high priority. No, it's, we're using just the Jenkins user, which is just a normal, a normal user. And the only idea we want for the Jenkins user is to be as normal as possible. So, as to pass any errors. Sometimes we, everything works for, even for us, we, which 
uh, we do not have root, and it doesn't work for Jenkins. Jenkins is a pure user. So it might be that the jobs don't run that night. Uh, no, the jobs are quite fast, so the, uh, the question, the question, the question was, uh, there might be the case that the jobs do not run. And yes, usually they, they do run, most of the time. <coughs> so, even if the system is loaded, it will take like two or three hours. Uh, but, yeah, it's... Uh, it depends on how uh, you you can put them in priority. That's not a problem. Uh, but generally, we didn't have the case that was uh, just hanging. Uh, but if if you notice running another job, then yeah, you can, you can yeah, yeah. I, mean, I mean, you can configure that you submit. Uh, for, this is I think that's a system configuration. So you could you configure that everything submitted by that user, or you could have a different user specifically to be high priority, and. Yeah, or you you have a partition specifically for for regression testing, but we don't do, do that, so it's just a matter of decision within our server. Okay. <coughs> yep. Um, you say you you're sharing your tests, or you're trying to share your tests via GitHub test definitions. Uh, yeah, the question was whether we, we share uh, our test. Yes, we do. So there is a folder there that's called CSCS text. We have also a private folder for some private tests. But yeah, the tests are shared. So you can um, start off from the test there and play around. These are real tests. How, how much work is it to port the test that works for you to our system? Is it mostly the configuration part of it, and then it should just work, or...? The, the question is, uh, what is the effort to port the tests uh, that we provide in another system? So, uh, yes, first thing is the configuration. Second thing, there are usually two things that you need to change in the tests. Uh, add your entry in the valid systems, and say, uh, you get uh, whatever, and then in also the valid programming environments, the name of your programming environments, and then just check whether the module name is correct. What if we don't have a programming environment? We don't have any query systems. Yeah, the question was, what if you don't have any programming environment? That's not a problem at all. Uh, the default configuration of the frame when you get it is set what we call um, uh, in for a generic system, and what we call a built-in programming environment, which is, if, 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 you, if you remember from the configuration, you just say that um, uh, the built-in programming environment is just empty. If this is a programming environment, it doesn't set any CCC or whatever, or no, it just says, for example, that the CC is the, is the, is the built-in CCC. It doesn't load any module at all. So it will use whatever is available there. Any other questions? Can you comment why they're, they're not all tests are shared? Yeah, the question was why not all the tests are, are shared. So there are two parts that they are not shared. There are full tests that they are not shared. So uh, some tests that we do not share are, um, we are adding also some tests about HTL and these kind of things, <coughs> which are an NDA. Then we have some other customers that they also, they're kind of NDA. And the other thing, the, in the test that we have some published, some resources of the test are not, uh, are not published. Just for the reason, there can, there can be two reasons. One reason is that the, we don't want to put any input files in the repo. We need a solution like GitLFS, which we haven't thought of uh, and we haven't bothered in doing this. Uh, and the other is sometimes we, we have got like a uh, an NVIDIA example code, and we have modified it. And just to avoid any license use, but on request, you can just send us an email. For example, I have a guy, can you send me the three notes input files, or, uh, and then I just send you. Okay, that's it, thank you. Thank you.